I can you know, back up a lot of what happens because Ben Staplefeld went in on this attack. And afterwards, he drew where all the enemy machine gun positions were. There was one right there, and there was another one down at the end of the street, and there were mortars on this side of the street that they've been showing. So, not this one, it's all around the corner. But so, Wasco gets hit by a sniper here. Where were the piles of enemy? And that's what Shifty told us from the crew. In the bar where so the third battalion's coming in like this car's coming here. And the other two platoons are, two platoons are coming in from the other way. And uh, that's why they didn't see uh, uh, the charge. Where the sniper was, yeah, was in uh, upstairs in this building? Looked like we might have came in from that way, you know, because we're coming down here, and this down here was not down here. Oh, so you came in from way over here? Yeah, so, uh, we were right inside here something. But they had so much the fog, and then they threw in smoke shells. Right. Mm -hmm. Came into the attack, I believe. Paul, the night of hell happened up here. A bunch of technology ended up here. Oh, he came down here with Paul, he said he remembers this barn. Now, Paul said he remembered this barn, that you came down from the ridge line over there, came down the field this way and in town in this direction. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to keep you down and give you the car. Uh, well, I, I'm telling <laughs> you, we want to hear it. the barn that uh, the guy was sticking his head out to me, it was a sniper. Yeah. 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 I know the movie. So I'm not saying it's from the movie. I'm saying it based on other guys. Where was the sniper in this one? He wasn't in the window. He was sticking his head out behind the corner of the barn. Over there? Well, yeah. Paul's yeah. almost yeah. here. That's Paul. You can. That's the story. I don't know where that story came from. Paul, watch it. Fifty dollars here, last year. Last year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and he, when I was talking to when I was talking to Marco, he said he was with Shifty. So Shifty said it wasn't that far enough there. Discussing with you, but with this Paul. So let's get this straight. That's why we're here. Was that the barn where Shifty shot the guy who was sticking his head around the corner? Paul, oh, you told me that this was the barn where you and Allie came up to. Yeah. The best I could. There was t at one time. Wasn't there two rows of buildings up here? I know there was a barn, and I wasn't too sure, but I know we come in up this way from over here, yeah. come over. And that's the barn that the uh, shifty shop was taken. Okay, because uh, we're pretty close to the church, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you see the people, and mm -hmm. I thought it was on our right, but uh, 
Well, it was. <laughs> I can see it now. Yeah. Yeah. But it was pretty close to the church. Well, yeah. the other one was there. So, boy, you're coming in this direction. Mm -hmm. That's where you had the night of hell, and that's where you launched the attack. Anyway, I'm going to turn around here. This is a reasonable position. This will be easy, this light here. This, this is Boswell Jacques Woods. Obvious for it is the main road. But sorry, no view. You yeah. guys cross the street before the nine and sitting in this wooding area. There you have hell night. Mm -hmm. Up here when they come into town. And 12 January you you, you came down the hill into Foy. Mm -hmm. This is Foy. There is timber. This yeah. is the original map. So yeah. this is you'll see yeah. all the timber here. Yeah, okay. We come out of that timber and cross an open yep. Yep. open field and come up to here. Right, yeah. But Shifty told Marco when he was here with Shifty that it was that barn over there that he got the sniper. And the year before he told me it was this one. <laughs> well, it was a barn. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But the barn, but Shifty told me he was, the, the uh, land behind you, the barn is like this, and there's two windows in the barn where you go and you look at the barn. And Shifty told us, he, he looked in the window, he saw two Germans inside the barn, and he pointed his rifle and he shot him in the barn. I will see it too. I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't vouch for that. That was many moons ago. Jim Alley, I'm uh, watching with him, and the guy was putting his head out, something jumped back, and Alley said, I'll tell you, when I say no, and the sister don't be right on where that guy's head kept going now. He said, when I say no, Alley so you're saying it's the corner yeah, of this barn right yeah, here? That's what they said. Yeah. Well, it isn't possible, it isn't possible, maybe, during the fight, that you, you guys go into the point, the chicks cross here then, the barn is not on, if this is the barn, on the pressure, uh, cross section next to the church. Maybe during the fight, after he shot the sniper behind the barn, well, that he crossed the street. Well, two other guys killed him. Well, two other guys killed that barn. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Uh huh. And 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 maybe during the fight you you crossed the street. Maybe that's what happened. Uh, or you were staying all the fight. You stay on this side of the road. Yeah, I think it did. Yes, yeah. I really did. You know, I I'm, I'm pretty right. sure. On the. All right. Well, then there was. You were up there. There were shells up there. Yeah. The window's been blown out. So, who did that? Yeah, I don't know. And uh, they told us. Goddamn reenactors. Come on, who's the No. Frank McCormick, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. I never did exactly locate exactly the building, you know, before that I said that uh, A.P. Heron and that other guy got killed. He no, was killed no, here. No. Yeah. No. There was a little barn outside of that row of hot buildings up there. Mm -hmm. And you know, I tried to locate it before. But that barn uh, was close to where Shifty shot. All right, yeah. so then the problem is that the was pulled up here. Mm -hmm. So it was a sniper up in that window that got the but it wasn't Shifty's oh, about that sniper. Yeah, right, that mm -hmm. right, 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 yeah. got a sniper right, here. Right, right. But there's another story. Later, you told about the old lady in the right. cellar. Oh, well, she was on the other side. Yeah? yeah. And you, you, you guys saw her coming out? or? No, I didn't see her then. Oh. No, I met her. But I met her. The cellar is, is on the corner. You saw the White House, the White House. with the bed yeah. metal. The shell came in and never exploded. Right. Mm -hmm. One guy, the Belgian guy, right. you know the family. And the, the yeah. woman is two, two months ago deceased. Uh, well, yeah. And we never saw her then. But she told me later, uh, in the uh, 50th anniversary, I met her and then I met her again. She told me she stayed in the cellar. Oh, yeah. Great. She was there with the whole family. The whole family was sitting yeah. in the cellar she, from the first White House of the corner. Yeah. With but our work, what, what Chris tried to do, and what we want to do is for the future, do, you guys can come down here, and during the whole fight, you never cross the main road again. I don't think we did. No. That's I important. Don't think we then did. we have to only have to figure out who shot the sniper in the building. Yeah. Second platoon was on that side. Yeah. 
and uh, they were under heavy fire. Right. And we knocked out the whatever, whoever. And who was on your left side? There was nobody on our left side. We were the only ones out. Right, because they were there alone as a platoon. Yeah. The yeah. other two platoons were over here. Second platoon and first platoon was in the field in, 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 on the other side of the road. Yeah. Yeah. They might have been. I don't know. And, and that's what uh, 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 Frank said in 2005. Okay. Frank McCarthy in 2005. He, he was telling that he was hiding behind the big tree for the, for the sniper and Carlos was trying to jump up and crow or jump or crow to the other side where was the, the, where there was an open gap in the, in the wall and he got hit, Carlos was get hit in the, in the head by the sniper. And well, you wouldn't have seen it Paul because if you're over here... Well, they was on the other side. Oh, we don't know anything about that. But Frank was yeah, hit. So it's a street. <laughs> a hit. Uh, Frank got his hit in his, in his butt, mm -hmm. and the bullet came out of the front. And it was, uh, Frank told us, he said, Carl Swasco, I was watching Carl, and he was right in the head. And he told us that Shifty was the guy who, who shot the sniper. I don't know what it was Shifty then, it was somebody else. It was somebody else. But Shifty, when I was here in, in 2004, and 2005, he showed us the window at the other side. Now it is closed by dirt. <laughs> but when you go in the barn, you see two, two windows. And he said, I'm sure there were two small windows with a metal, how you say the protection in it? Yeah, bar. Yeah. Bar. And uh, I look in and I saw two Germans sitting on the ground. And there where he shot the Germans. That's what he told me. We go look at the window. Well, I don't think that's pretty good in the middle one. I was well, the only thing that's kind of in dispute is uh, where Shifty shot the sniper. Where we just go in there that way and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, according to Marco, on 19, in the 50th anniversary, when Shifty came over, mm -hmm. he told Marco it was the building across the road. That's the one I would go with. Yeah, but... The Shifty said... I was Shifty with you. For more than one reason, I though. Shifty was too. Mm -hmm. You think this trip... It's fun with these guys now. To see how shifty they are. Yeah. Same time. Oh yeah. What happened to you? They like that. They must have been. Yeah. 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 Hey, Joel, could you grab me a beer, please? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Some more time. Actually, I think it's... No, it's not more time. It's a very... It's a very... It's a Thank you.
He took off when you guys were in the woods and said, I'm walking. That's all I want to know. Now we're going to make a turn here. We're going to see a gray building here on the right. That 88 was in position here. Just in front of us where that pass is done, you'll notice that the road dips down. And that's the swale where the guys could cross the road without being seen. Yeah, but it is. Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, you're going to see the rest of the guys are Yeah, let me get to what you do. Okay, we're good to go. Okay. Okay. Now, so off to the right again, boy. The left of boy is the phone. We're going to start hitting fox holes here, and then as we keep going down, we'll see more. No, this is our... Okay, now in there, this is new, I think. So this is where the night of hell is going to occur. So this is where our showing, where a bunch of my power are hit. Oh, 
this up on a knee from no deal. <laughs> if you want, very briefly, I can watch you up there and you can start to see some of the other, the other replacements. We'll make it quick though because it's getting dark. No, So where would they where would they place the guns, Chris? Gun there. There's a gun down there that we know of. Is this here? You go out here. There are smaller foxholes back there. Is a squared off trench system, and the Germans always did squared defensive positions. Trash pits. This one I've been in when the, the weeds were down, but from here. You can hit where there were just over on the other side of the road with artillery fire, and you can bring fire down across the road in the block house. So they had this whole thing ringed with guns. The Americans don't dig stuff like this. And when Mark. <coughs> Trying to figure out what happened because of their reports about attacking from this side of the town and where they were receiving artillery fire from, and then Marco got the German maps and then maps our maps up with the German maps and came out here and started looking. And the what Germans, the Americans couldn't dig; they would put bug slip trenches, right. short, this right. long over. And the Germans on the German wartime map, they got a perimeter line on this side of that crest. So they had an MLR there, so they would have infantry out in front supporting these guns. Germans must have been past both of this. And this would explain why the shelling was so bad. If it was just two eighty eights, it wouldn't have been the night of hell. It would have been a bad bombardment. But you can't run two eighty eights for four hours and do the kind of damage that they got. So what, what, what were they, what did they have? 88 to 105. Oh, okay. Probably 88. Because the other thing is if it's a battery, a flat cannon, flat cannon, it's going to be four to six guns. Other side of the road, yeah. one, two, three, four. Well, you're saying this, this is the result of a 88? As soon as the Germans pushed the Americans out of Noville, they built. Right. Because they concentrate on other areas. Right. Oh yeah, because they can they can bring fire down in the Bastogne from here. And if you follow this road into Bastogne, it's right by Hotel Le Brun and Roberts headquarters. And there's a bridge there over the railroad tracks, and they have accounts of guys being right there at that bridge taking 88 car. Well, these trees down here are these trees here. Some of them are here. And they show they just look like Well, these, you look at the trees, how they are? Yeah. They're planted in rows, so they just slice the piece to them. No. Hmm. 
But if they had to take a three down, they'd take a three down. They're looking that way. And they're getting a the ring of fire from over there all the way around. You know, they're taking fire. Third Army first encountered um, the German perimeter and broke through. direction. Car 
direction. This is a World War I monument. Okay, this um, is not Fourth Harmon. The two, the two guys in particular I want to mention here are Patton and Abram. Uh, and the two leadership's traits would be knowledge and initiative. Now we'll talk a little bit more about Patton when we talk about uh, his crossing of the Sour River down by Beekirk. But one of the things about Patton and the, the leadership characteristic I want to stress for him is knowledge. Now I think our popular impression of Patton is bluster and braggadocio and hard charging and all this sort of stuff. But the most notable characteristic for me of Patton was his knowledge of the situation and he was constantly studying everything that might be of relevance and constantly trying to stay on top of the situation. Now if you think back to December 16th, his intelligence officer had a job not only to watch what was in front of Third Army, but to watch the whole Western Front. And his intelligence officer said that there are all these German divisions that all of a sudden I can't account for. Now, a lot of the other senior Allied commanders thought, well, we've beaten them, you know, they're, don't worry about it, they're somewhere. But Patton thought that there could be a German counteroffensive. And because Patton read his history and he knew what the Germans had done in years past, he had a good feeling that something might happen in the Ardennes. He wasn't sure, but he said if something's going to happen, it's going to happen there. So while his whole staff is working on plans for Third Army, which is further south, to keep pushing on into Germany, he said, I also want you to prepare some plans in case we have to go up north. The Germans break through. He's going to go to Verdun for this meeting with Eisenhower. And before he leaves, he says, if I call you, I'm going to give you one of three letters. And depending on which letter I give you, you're going to have to react. And, and one of the letters corresponded to taking his army, shifting it to the 90 degrees and driving it north to the Ardennes. He doesn't know where specifically, but he's, his men are already preparing because he's taken the time to look at the whole situation and not just get focused on his one particular spot of the front. He goes to the meeting, they describe the breakthrough, <clears throat> Eisenhower goes to Patton and says, you know, when can you start to launch a drive to relieve Bastogne? And he says, as soon as you let me out of this meeting. And Eisenhower's response is, don't be fatuous, George. You can start on the 22nd. As soon as the meeting's over, Patton calls, and he starts the movement of his troops that are going to eventually result in the relief of Bastogne. And one of the trickiest maneuvers in combat the two trickiest ones are retreating in order, and the second one is withdrawing your force while it's fighting the enemy and turning and going off in a different direction. So there's a, going to be a massive movement of 3rd Army as they do that, 7th Army to their right is going to extend to the, up and fill the gap. And Patton's guys are going to start racing forward, but it's only because Patton made sure to assess the whole situation, stay up on things. He was also, and I like this one, really well aware of history. And he knew that this was one of the Germans' favorite areas to come through. They had all the road maps. So he was ready to get the armies going. They're going to start fighting up from the area around Metz, Tionville, up north. At the head of the advance is going to be 4th Armored. And one of the combat commands of 4th Armored is going to be led by a man named Creighton Abrams, who we talked about yesterday. Abrams, by the 26th, he is going to be, they're going to have been fighting up this road here where that car just came up. And he's going to have orders to attack on to Sabret. And about 4.30 in the afternoon, he's going to come to that crossroads right there. And he's going to see C-47s flying overhead in the direction of Bastogne to drop supplies to the defenders. And he makes the decision that if they're still dropping supplies into the perimeter with C-47s, <coughs> things are going to be pretty bad. So acting on his own initiative, and this is the second trait, he disregards his orders to move into Sabret. 
and again I think the description has him just charging blindly down the road and in a sense he does but he sees his forces he's going to have some tanks up here some armored infantrymen he's going to risk them and he's going to take the initiative to charge down to the hill to try to break through he probably realizes he doesn't have a force large enough to relieve the city but just the morale impacts of these guys knowing that the fourth armored has come up he figures it's worth the risk so he goes to a lieutenant named Boge <coughs> and he says you're going to charge down that road and you're going to barrel through whatever you hit and I don't know what you're going to find but I want you to get into Bastogne and tell them we're coming I don't know if you guys out on the line had heard that Pat the third army was coming up or not but Patton had been, they'd been getting in touch with McAuliffe saying, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. George, I don't know if you remember if anybody in headquarters. I had a, uh, a radio message uh, from one of the uh, tankers and uh, <laughs> he had a bad fist. His hands must have been cold, so I told him to switch the voice. And uh, they <laughs> alerted us not to shoot at them as they came up the highway. <laughs> Do you remember what day that was? 26. 26? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... How many tanks are we talking about? Well, it's the whole 4th Armored, but right up here, when they launched that attack, it's 8. And half track. Company of Armored Infantrymen and 8 tanks. So, again, you know, relieved, however you want to describe the 4th Armored's arrival, I don't think Abrams was thinking that he's going to all of a sudden affect the relief of Bastogne. It's more he wants to get in there quick so the guys on the perimeter know that they're up. So disregarding his orders, he's going to send them in. He's going to have some artillery support farther back. And he says, when you get my word, I want you to play it soft and sweet, which means they're going to launch a barrage onto the village of Assamalaw, which is going to be down this hill. Again, he doesn't know what's in there, but he has reason to believe that if it's a village, that it's going to be held. And because his infantry support is going to be riding right in the half tracks, they're not going to be, it's not going to be a slow movement. So again, we talked about what happens when infantry gets separated from tanks. He doesn't want that to happen. So he's going to do a barrage down onto Assinois and punch right down through the town. Now we're going to go to Assinois and I'll talk as we go. But what happens is as this column charges down the road, it's going to start getting separated and strung out. And they're going to start hitting a lot of Germans down there. So, if you want, you can take some pictures, and then we'll get back on the bus and drive slowly down into Assinois, and I'll show you where they affect the breakthrough. There's Andre with George. Work out that way. But the call of new. Knew they were coming. <coughs> so the tanks are going to head off. The column's going to head off down this road. Um, pretty much into the unknown. But everybody there has got a sense of the urgency of uh, getting into the guys that are trapped in the perimeter. They were pretty much limited to the roads, weren't they? Right, that's they couldn't correct. cross country. Uh, Herb was saying that they were limited to the roads. This column stayed on the road. Now remember, just the day before, on Christmas Day, the Germans had uh, launched that last big attack and broken through at Hemroll temporarily. So it was, it was a close front thing. And this area had a lot of uh, uh, German paratroopers were defending this area and uh, some Volkskrummer years. Was that when the, oh, that when one German tank got into the, into the town of Bastogne and got somebody to the edge. threw a grenade in the, in the t tank because he had noticed the top was bouncing as he was yep. going across the rubble and yep. ran up and 
pop dropped a grenade in the in the tank. Column started to take some fire from that woodlot to the left. Uh, there are some German positions in there. And they would start trying to lay suppressing fire into the woods. They didn't stop. You know, customarily, if you hit opposition like that, you dismount your armored infantry and try to flush them out, but they didn't do that in here. They just kept going. to the village of Asinois, and as they got up here, the artillery fire started coming in, and they hit a hornet's nest in the town, and this, uh, I'll read sections of this passage, this is from George's book, um, and it's written by Boges, who commanded the tanks anywhere, in, in, in this attack. Um, I mounted his tank, Abrams, that afternoon, and we studied a well-worn battle map. He decided that C Company would take a little known secondary road leading from Clochimont through Asinois to Bastogne, a distance of approximately three and a half miles. He explained that there had been no recon work done on the road, but it no was known that all this area was held by the enemy. If we could get through on this road, it might work well for a surprise attack. He gave me a familiar, short, and explicit order which so simply get to those men in Bastogne. I called Lieutenant Rolson and the seven tank sergeant commanders together and the following plan was employed. As company commander, I would be in the lead tank and I would set the speed of the attack. I would fire straight ahead. Rolson would be in the second tank firing to the right, the following tank to the left and so on down. Each man was given the route and the objective. Each tank was to continue the attack to the last tank if necessary. And with that, we were ready. Abrams gave us the familiar hand signal and we started to roll. It isn't possible for me to remember the names of all 45 men who made that run. Uh, my own tank crew consisted of Herbert Smith, Milton Dickerman, Harold Hafner, and James Murphy, all battle-proven veterans. I was told later that Company C carried a 46th man with them on the run. One soldier returned from the hospital on a supply truck, jumped off, ran, caught the last tank, and managed to wedge himself in it. Where they ran, found room inside a tank for him, I'll never know. We moved at full speed, pumping heavy fire straight ahead into the right and left of the road. As soon as my tank cleared Clochimont, I called for artillery fire on Asinois. Almost immediately, the town seemed to erupt. Falling directly behind our tanks was Captain Bill Dwight of the 37th Tank and the 53rd Armored Infantry. Still maintaining fire and speed, the column neared Asinois, and I called battalion for them to raise the artillery fire 200 yards. Due to the speed of the tanks and the time lapse of getting the command to, to the gun crews, our tanks entered Asinois under our own artillery fire. This allowed the momentum of the attack to continue. After clearing the town, the first four tanks ran into enemy resistance coming from both sides of the road. The other five tanks, along with Captain Dwight, were slowed briefly because of the resistance. Teller mines were thrown in the path of our oncoming tanks and half-tracks. Captain Dwight dis Captain Dwight dismounted and personally directed the clearing of the road, thus allowing the tanks to get through. Mopping up operations were continued in Asinois by the 53rd Armored Infantry. So what's going to happen is they get into Asinois, some of the tanks are going to separate off, as well as the Armored Infantry, to try to fight the Germans in this town. As that happens, Boges is out in front, and the, and the column is going to get spread out. And when he talked about 
the tanks, the, the column getting separated, as they get to the top of the hill here, uh, Germans are going to cross the run across the road with teller mines, <coughs> and one of the half tracks is going to hit the mines. So the, the column is getting smaller and smaller. But again, the guns are just going to keep firing as they go down the down the road. The infantry starts to clear the area. Uh, there are other accounts that have them again, like the tanks spraying the woods on either side of the road, trying to keep the Germans off, off the vehicles. car is at that crossroads there. I'll pick up the story again for Boges. I saw a large pillbox ahead and ordered Dickerman to throw several rounds into it. It was demolished. I saw the enemy in confusion on both sides of the road. <coughs> Obviously they were surprised as some were standing in a chow line. They fell like dominoes. As we cleared the woods we came upon a small open field where we saw multicolored parachutes. That's that field to our left. These had been recently used to drop supplies of food and ammo to the 101st. That meant, this meant that we were near the line defending the town. I slowed the tanks down and we cautiously approached what seemed to be a line of foxholes spaced about 50 feet apart. Out of each hole, a machine gun was leveled at my tank with a helmeted figure behind each gun. The men of the 101st knew full well that the enemy had been using American uniforms during the past few weeks and they were taking no chances. I called out to them, come out, this is the 4th armored, but no one moved. I called again and again, and finally an officer emerged from the nearest foxhole and approached the tank. He reached up a hand and with a smile said, I'm Lieutenant Dwayne Webster of the 326th Engineers, 101st Airborne Division. Glad to see you. He was no more glad to see me than I was glad to see him. As I shook his hand, I knew the company C... ...had broken through the bulge and that the siege of Bastogne was over. A few minutes later, Captain Dwight and Colonel Abrams came up and met General McAuliffe. All the tanks with their crew had made the drive successfully and Patton had missed his boast by only a few hours. The Third Army was in Bastogne. And then um, one of the troopers wrote, The next real excitement in this sector came on the day the Fourth Armor came through Assinois. Our CP had apparently been in touch with them because we knew they were knew they were the cause of all the noise in Assinois on the other side of the woods <coughs> about mid-afternoon. Besides, Lieutenant Webster's was in one of the foxholes close behind our position. Late afternoon or early evening, just before dark, dark, we saw the half-tracks and a tank or two coming up the slight hill with their fifties blazing and lighting up the snow around us. We just hoped they saw us in time to shut it off. They even took a couple of shots with the 75s at the little guardhouse pillbox to our left front. Then they stopped right by our hole and yelled that it's all okay. 
That night we ate sea rash rations, drank some of their wine, had a bonfire, and thought that maybe I should write home to my mom. Well, write home so my mom wouldn't have to worry about me. Okay, if you want to get out, you can see the uh, pillbox uh, where they where they linked up, and then we'll get back into Bastogne. Yeah. 